Hello and welcome to Pretty Good Gaming. We are here to have a little chat about EA's latest earnings call. I'm Henry and I'm here with Mr. Gareth Evans. How are you doing? Hello everybody. I'm good, thank you. Fabulous. Now, EA have just had an earnings call where they, you know, they, they talk about how they haven't earned as many millions as they did last year and they're all so disappointed about it and it's just it's just no good. Yeah. What a, what a letdown. Oh, my heart bleeds for them. Devastating. Really does. All those millions, they, ugh. Oh. They just don't make enough millions, do they? Uh, they're going to have to buy a smaller wallet. Oh, oh my God. This is just a shame. Terrible. Now, there's a few quotes here that I've nicked from PC Gamer's article, which is kind of a, a roundup-y type thing of the earnings call. And the first one I've got here is, the reality is, it's not just an EA challenge, it's an industry-wide challenge. Now, that's talking about games as a service, which we all love. We love a good game as a service, right? Mm. And when I say that, that's a complete lie. So, EA is saying that games as a service are, are really difficult, and the industry's not adapted to them. Yeah. And all I can think is maybe stop making them then. Yeah, this is this is his excuse, isn't it? Andrew Wilson. Oh yeah, we didn't we, we made like oh, X amount of millions less than we wanted to make. And it's yeah, it's it's because uh, games as a service is a challenge and it's not just a challenge for us, it's a challenge for the whole industry. It's only a bloody challenge because you've decided to do games as a service. Why not just just make true games like single player games, just normal games. Don't try and milk your player base. That's what games as a service is, right? A recur and consumer yeah. spending and other, other ways of taking money off our consumers like that's that's what is it oh it's a hard it's, ch it's challenging this is why oh yeah we feel sorry for you Will, Andrew Wilson not because you've failed on this games as a service this quarter because you're an absolute fool who thinks that this is the way forward <laughs> and that this is how you're gonna like win the industry because it's not it's so challenging trying to think of new ways to, to hoodwink players into giving us more <laughs> money they're too aware yeah oh they, yeah yeah, yeah, people. Oh, God, those damn YouTubers raising awareness <laughs> and this, that Reddit. Oh, God Almighty, if it wasn't for them, it would be so much easier to take money off people. How will they get pride and accomplishment without us? <laughs> <laughs> so I've got another one here. You're moving from what was initially a Bioware game, which would be somewhere between 40 and 80 hours of offline play, to 40 to 80 hours of offline play plus 100 or 200, 300 hours of Elder game that happens with millions of other players at scale online. That's the talking about the development of Anthem and how generally when you think of Bioware you think of big story driven RPGs like Mass Effect so why don't you just make that? that that's the guess the game everyone wanted and a lot of people hoping you were making or thought you were making but yeah. no it's got to be live service yeah well that, that's the th that's what they've tried to do here they've tried to generate Anthem from Bioware who are famous for these long single player role playing games then instead they've come up with Anthem which it, it's failed on so many levels for them and he says it's because it's a game with not just the single player content, mind you, it's 100 or 200 or 300 hours of Elder Game. Whatever Elder Game is. Uh, I think he means end game, right? Yeah, I think it's their <laughs> word for end game. Right. So <laughs> all those, end, I mean, if you ask anybody who's played Anthem, there's nowhere near 40 to the eight hours of offline play plus hundreds, 300 hours of end game. That isn't even true. And and he's saying, oh, it's a challenge for us because this is what we're trying. Well, you rushed Anthem out the door. It wasn't ready for the market. Yeah. You, you, it, it was content incomplete and games like The Division 2 came out a few weeks later and put you to shame yeah. with the amount of content in that game and you're trying to bullshit your investors and people listening to what you're saying here Andrew by saying that oh it's a challenge because we've got all this content to make now biggest company in the whole industry pretty much in terms of manpower and you can't even do that Ubisoft to put you to shame in, in those terms stop the bullshit man yeah just, just leave it out and the reason Anthem failed is because Anthem failed because it was built badly they had so many problems, which we learned in Jason Schreier's really good Kotaku article exposing everything. That That's why Anthem didn't do well, because it had so many problems. It's not, oh, it just didn't work because it's yeah. games as a service and the industry doesn't know how how to use them. Yeah. It was a disjointed game. Was it a single player game? Was it a multiplayer game? It's supposed to be both. Like, how does that work? Well, there's a single player area, so, you, so, so if you're a fan of a single player game in Bioware, you can have your single player <laughs> experience, whereas Fort Tarsus was just an empty shell of a place to walk around and people just stood there looking at you weird. Yeah, if, if you like single player games, you can just hang out in Fort Tarsus and not shoot anything <laughs> and not fly anywhere and not do anything fun. Yeah, and if you like multiplayer games, you can go on one mission and then like have a loading screen to get back to Fort Tarsus and then a cash in your mission, get another mission and then have another loading screen and then everything is just so disjointed and, yeah. and just not fluid at all. Like, 
Come on. It's just Come a bad game, full stop. So then I've got another quote here. As games have gotten bigger, that system isn't working as well as it has done in years gone by. Now that's, again, saying, oh, live services don't work in the current industry. So instead of maybe trying to not make a live service game, they want to change the whole industry. They want to shift everyone's perspective, not just EAs, the whole world, to yeah. be... Games as a service is, is how we can do it. Let's all pull together and team up to fleece every consumer in the world. Yeah, have games, games have gotten bigger. And I think I think this is one of the biggest problems with the industry right now. And you've he you've heard it from ex-EA employee Amy Hennig. She's talked about it recently, um, ex Visceral Games. And she talks always talks, and this is, it was her quote that kick-started the whole uh, single-player games are dead. I think it was the end of 2017, where she said, oh, nobody's making single-player games anymore because nobody finishes them. No nobody gets to the end of the story. And that, I think that's, the problem with these companies is that they're analyzing data they're looking at statistics rather than and, and trying to figure out what games to make based on all this information yeah. and data rather than looking at what's a good game what games sell well because of what features they've implemented how they've iterated on the genre what good things gameplay wise that they've done in order to have a successful game they're not doing any of that they're just analyzing the industry and seeing what works well with trends and trying to make a game out of it and so the result net result is oh sing people don't finish single player games people don't get to the end of the stories like and, and half the games so but tell that to um games like god of war like who who cares how many people finished god of war who cares how many people finished the story in red dead redemption 2 who cares how many people finished spider-man numerous other single player games yeah. days gone any of those games that are very successful commercially because of they they've done some fundamental basics right who cares about any of that successful games if you're not chasing cash if you're not going games as a service i feel like this is what it is it's just a justification to go games of a, ser yeah. as a service oh these people aren't finishing our games so um oh yeah that's a decent reason to tell them that's why we're doing games as a service it's it's bullshit is what it is and I, the problem is that so many companies now in the industry are following this bullshit trend just to try and milk people of cash and not just looking at the statistics around the industry rather than looking at what actually it's a good gameplay feature what's a bad gameplay feature and trying to be and trying to make good games that way yeah the thing is no one finishes games as a service because by the very nature they go on forever like you finish your main story if there is one and then you you grind to unlock better stuff and again by its nature it's it's quite repetitive because you, you're doing a lot of the same tasks over and over again but well, while you, that's happening you're getting milked yeah you can't finish it because it, it's supposed to go on forever they're going to keep adding stuff to make it go on forever so you're never going to finish it I'm more likely to finish a, a 60 hour Red Dead Redemption 2 that yeah. I have a 300 hour games as a service. So my next quote here is, so what you should expect from us is that it's not just about changing the development process in the game, it's not just about changing the QA process in the game, although both of those things are being changed dramatically inside our organization right now, but it comes down to changing how we launch games. Players need to understand exactly what it is they're going to be playing and how they're going to be playing both on the day of launch and over time. Now my first instinct with that is that sounds good, because it's about managing expectations and making sure can players are informed about what they're going to get when they when they buy the game mm -hmm. instead of kind of such a convoluted mess because no one really knew what Anthem was before it came out because the, the trailers were all... The messaging was so mixed. Yeah, trailers were like, oh, it's, you're, you're flying around, you're doing explosions and stuff, but then it, it's like a multiplayer thing, uh, but it's a game as a service. It's like, how, what do you do? What, what does Anthem even mean? Yeah, it's a single player game as well, as well as it, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to appeal to everybody. I think it's a, a large part of the marketing around it so it's going to try and appeal to everybody and, and, and trying to tick as many boxes in terms of the marketing sheet as as possible and it ended up uh, appealing to very few because yep. it because there's no specific hook that gets people you know people aren't clear on what the game's supposed to be and what uh, it what it tried to do other games did better look at the division because it was massively more successful than anthem because the core gameplay loop of the loot grind and being a loot shooter division did it better yeah if you make a good game it's gonna do well so then if you make a good game you don't have to worry half as much about the launch when you launch a game obviously it's gonna be super stressful because how are people gonna receive it but if you just make the best game you possibly can and don't try and be so underhanded trying to fleece every single nickel and dime from your player base just make a good game yeah I think going back to my earlier point about them um, trying to learn how to make games from analyzing data and, and statistics within the industry rather than learning how to make great games by looking at great examples of great games and how they were supported you think of games like The Witcher 3 right that's one of the most successful games of the last few years not because it launched well it's one of the most successful games of the last few years because 
because not only was it a great game at launch, they supported it well. And after that, it's it's grown in popularity over the lo- years after it's launched, and it is is one of the biggest tales in terms of sales after the launch year. And those are the lessons they should be learning. Like this is how we should treat our players. This is how we should deliver DLC. This is how we should deliver a 60 hour plus um, game with which is content packed. This is this is how we should produce a game. Not this is how what this is what money you should be chasing in terms of microtransactions. This is bullshit, right? Yeah, and when you get a good game, everyone talks about it. Not just reviewers, but players, actual game players. They'll talk about it, and then you'll hear, "Oh, that's a good game," and it will work. That that's how word of mouth is the most powerful marketing tool. If you hear a bad game, everyone's going to be like, "Oh, I'm not going near that." It's just, it's just how humankind works when it comes to buying stuff. Uh, I've got another one here. You should expect that we'll start to test things like soft launches, the same things you see in the mobile space right now. And yeah, because this is definitely the first time we've seen mobile trends come over to uh, mainstream console and PC gaming. Yeah, because microtransactions, everyone loves those ones, don't they? Using mobile games as a model for how to produce AAA games. Like, mobile games are making so much money, how can we rip people off just like mobile games are. That's the lessons that they learn. This is literally what they're telling us here. Well, oh, we're going to make games like mobile games because that's where the money is. And they're definitely going to try and keep milking that cash cow because Apex is coming to mobile at some point um, in the future. That's one of their big plans, following the uh, the old Fortnite bandwagon. So that's going to keep making them even more money. And I feel like the soft launches thing is exactly pretty much, I think they might have learned that lesson from Rockstar and Red Dead Online. The way that they Soft launch is the soft launch the online version of Red Dead Online. In that way, because it's not a 1.0 release, it's early access, it's beta, or whatever it what you want to call it. They avoid reviews. They avoid the negative reviews on day one. Like Anthem could, <laughs> Anthem yeah. got panned by reviews, and it's like it's still suffering because of that, right? Had they have had a soft launch like Red Dead Online, maybe it had, had gotten away with a lot of shit like Red Dead Online is doing now. The economy is so broken in Red yeah. Dead Online, and they're trying to flip. They've already got microtransactions in there right they're already trying to trying to balance the way to f- how they fleece their player base as much as possible without generating as much outrage right and that's that's balancing games these days in triple a it's, yeah. it's not about how powerful your weapon is it's about how much they can push microtransactions without pissing off their players exactly and like calling it red dead online beta or it's the anthem beta or whatever it all just means you can hide behind any criticism if, if they're like oh your progression doesn't work your monetization is terrible it's really glitchy like yeah but it's a beta yeah it doesn't, doesn't matter it's, it's not a finished beta. article we, we will be able to rate in we're listening to your feedback and we um, we promise to be better in future that same we're, we're such heroes because this soft launches thing soft launches do happen betas early access they happen everywhere half of them are monetized so they can just sell you the unfinished version at a higher rate because I'll, I'll buy buy the the special edition which is ten dollars more and you'll get the beta so you're paying more for a less good game that's just bonkers to me uh, another quote here and it also comes down to changing how we communicate with players our entire marketing organization is now moving out of presentation mode and into conversation mode and changing how we interact with players over time now again this one sounds kind of good like instead of just showing oh look how pretty our game is look at all all these special effects and stuff that's going on all explosions yeah fun and seems like it's more yeah we're going to talk to players we're going to see what the criticism are see what they want and we're going to do that but but coming from ea it's just so disingenuous yeah that's true conversation mode what does that even mean that yes because developers on this scale triple a or ea they they won't won't have a conversation they'll be telling you information all right they might not have these marketing divisions who just spout information information and expect this to lap up their bullshit what they'll be doing is they'll be targeting like reddit threads and stuff like that and answering people on a more personal note but it'll still be nonetheless bullshit it'll still be bullshit it'll still be oh yeah we'll be we'll iterate over time we understand your grievances we're listening to the players feedback we'll be doing all this blah 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 blah. that's what he's talking about there he's talking about smoothing people over exactly in forums and shit rather than having them get outraged without them (laughs) without them uh, being able to 
and reply to it. And listening to player feedback doesn't actually mean you'll do anything about it. It's not a promise. It's just <laughs> like, oh yeah, you said you didn't like this mechanic or this glitch. We're, we're, we're listening to you. We, we hear you. It's no guarantee that they're going to go and make things better. Uh, another one here. We think that we're in really good position for this. I think it gets really hard if you don't have scale to do this, and so we feel very good about it. And over time, we hope that we can lead from the front and help other developers and publishers change the way they do things as well. Because we're an enormous international company with billions and billions of dollars we're so inspiring to the little guy yeah we're gonna make all you little publishers and developers better by following our example yeah i i, I fear for the industry if that happens i think people like cd project red should be the, the the people inspiring the rest of the industry because they do things so well and they put players first and they don't just say that they're doing things right they they, they actually speak louder than words and that's the problem with the a that the words are so hollow that nobody believes them. Anyone outside, anyone who's familiar with them in gaming, in the industry, knows that this is, maybe they're not as cynical as me, but a majority of them will recognize this for what it is, and it's all just bullshit. Like, oh, we are the best, we're the leaders, we, we, we're we doing this, we're doing that. There's, there's nothing that EA can produce that appeals to the majority of informed gamers. I'm not sure they believe that bullshit themselves, but that's what they're saying, and yeah. uh, it just stinks. The only way I can glean any sort of positive kind of perspective from this is if this means change, there's potential for it to be a positive change. And yeah, maybe they could pivot away from games as a service. That is just not going to happen, but it's the only kind of positive angle I can I can generate in my brain to yeah. be like, or oh, may what what's one potential good way out of this well a positive is that Jedi Fallen Order is on its way and that's a single player Star Wars game the, the likes of which people have been crying out for for years yeah. they've not had a decent single player Star Wars game and with the, the projections on that game um, being pretty high I mean if it does if the game does really well for them it might just open their eyes if it turns over a lot of money for them it might they might just make them think twice about their insistence on this game as a service model and if they can generate the game it is respawn we've got a lot of faith in them if they can generate this game without all the controversy surrounding all the previous star wars games or the most recent star wars games at least and to just deliver a decent product for a good price without all that bullshit attached yeah. to it then you know who knows they that's the only way that i see them seeing the light yeah however i'm very cynical and i don't see them giving up on games as a service no. it's just it just makes too much money for them those loot fifa loot box these fifa ultimate team cards man they're yeah. just a ca they're printing cash with that shit. Exactly, it's a license to print money. EA definitely aren't pretty confident in Jedi Fallen Order though, because they're projecting somewhere between 6 to 8 million in sales by the end of the fiscal year, so that's by the end of March 2020, and the game comes out uh, in sometime in November. And looking at some of the major single player uh, releases from this year, Resident Evil 2 did about 3 million in, la in launch sales, DMC5 did about 2 million, and Kingdom Hearts 3 did about 5 million, and Days Gone is supposed to have been the best selling game of the year on any platform so far, but so it's even bigger than all of those, but we don't have any actual numbers for that one yet. So that's kind of the ballpark of the the most successful games at the moment, and I, it's more than likely that Jedi Fallen Order is going to do pretty well because they've said it's no microtransactions, it's everything we want, and it's Star Wars, man. Everyone knows how bankable Star Wars is. It's like the most profitable uh, brand right now. Sure. They've got the movie coming out in in December, episode nine. It's around Christmas as well. Well, there's yeah. Christmas presents, stocking fillers. Exactly. When when kids see the movie, they're gonna come out and be like, "Yeah, I want I want to play the the new game. Buy me the game. Buy me the game. Buy me the game." Yeah. Pester power, man. It's it's most valuable marketing tool in the world. <laughs> Get the kids on side, and then you win the parents. That's it. But the last Star EA Star Wars game, Star Wars Battlefront Two. That underperformed, but still sold 7 million units by the end of 2017 when it came out. And that was out in the November of that year. So there is still a clear interest in Star Wars, but the loot box debacle around that game might have soured people on, on Star Wars and EA as a whole. So that definitely could give them a hit, but I, I reckon they'll be all right. Yeah, I think so. I think Vince Sampella, who is Respawn CEO, who, who is developing the game has also been out and saying 
also already been out saying no microtransactions, no loot boxes in our single player game. So that's part of his promotion now. That's part of what he's how he's trying to sell the game. And if he sticks to those guns, which he, pro he definitely should do, because that's one of the biggest selling points of this game. Because, because like I said, uh, of the soured player base from the previous Star Wars games, I think that this could do really well, especially you know casual player who who just wants a Star Wars experience, just wants to be a Jedi yeah. or whatever, and just wants to enjoy that maybe he doesn't want to play online there's so many more players who this would appeal to that wouldn't that battlefront 2 wouldn't have appealed to because me for example i just won't play a game like battlefront 2 because it's an online, online persistent game it's like there's no there's nothing that appeals to me in it a single player game with a narrative with a story the definite beginning and an end no macro transactions no online no bullshit like that I'm all about that. As well as games as a service being the future for EA, at least as far as they're concerned, they really want to keep pushing their EA Access and EA Origin program things because one of the EA Access is now available on PS4 and will across be soon, yeah. yeah will will yeah will be available and they've got millions and millions of players on that on those um, subscriptions and mm. they're very little work for massive rewards now I'm, I'm not saying it's it's easy to run these services or anything on, mm -hmm. you know from from the back end or whatever but you don't have to develop the game you just have to make it available on there and then reap the rewards that's right just build up a library of games and then get people to pay seven eight pounds or how much it is per month to be able to access the games they'll never own the games and they'll be able to take the games away if you cancel your subscription you ne you'll never be able to play the game again yeah. unless you resubscribe but this is this is the way that EAC the future uh, in terms of keeping their income coming on a monthly basis. They've got this income coming now, which they can guarantee. It's like something like 15 million subscriptions to the EA Access service, which is a lot of damn subscriptions. And you think about uh, every one of those subscribers are paying in excess of eight, seven, eight pounds per month. It's a lot of money to be coming in every month. And it works for EA. And, and why wouldn't they want to do that if people are willing to pay that money for those games? I mean, I'm just very cynical when it comes to EA. And when they say they're going to change because, uh, we've learned lessons from Anthem and this is how we're going to do things differently they, they never ever put the players first they always think about how they're going to do it differently in terms of how much how can we avoid the scandal yeah. how can we get the reviewers a little bit Ha reviews a little bit higher how can we make more money off people without upsetting them anymore mm. that those are the lessons that they're trying to learn they're not learn trying to learn lessons about how to make better games and that's the fundamentally what's wrong with ea and why it's so rotten at its core that's my like major glimmer of hope when it comes to jedi fallen order because if that does really well and everyone buys it when it comes to that game a lot of people are saying oh, i refuse to buy it because it's ea and it's got ea's name on it but then i think if it does well reviews say it's clean no microtransactions great story if, it, if it's the single player game we've really wanted just buy it send the message vote with your wallet yeah it not just don't buy the bad ones yeah do buy the good ones no i understand that but i also understand the point of view where people have been soured yeah, by absolutely. ea so much in the past that they don't want to give another dime to them because they feel like they've been ripped off or treated badly in the past totally get that and i'm yeah. behind people who who want to stick to the guns in that way too so that's it from us talking about ea a little bit ranty i don't think it was too bad nah. we've, been, we've been a bit bitchy this week ranting, uh, ranting about uh, randy pitchford yesterday andrew wilson this day it needs to be done man yep. these people need to be put in their place exactly who's next tomorrow let us know in the comments <laughs> should we just fight each other well we'll be back on friday with our regular news roundup video so make sure you stay tuned for that i've been henry he's been gaz we'll see you then bye for now